Next, from the City Club of Chicago, we hear from three local mayors who talk about the effect of rising pension costs on their ability to run city government and what needs to be done to address the suburban pension crisis. This runs about 30 minutes. Of course, you know who these gentlemen are. Christopher Canning, the village president of Wilmette, the Northwest Municipal Conference. Uh, Gerald Bennett, president of Palos Hills, Southwest Conference of Mayors. And um, Sam Pula, president West Central Municipal Conference, uh, the mayor of Westchester. So uh, why don't you guys start? And any preference, any order? This is the city club. Uh, among yourselves, go. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, as Professor Green said, my name is Chris Canning. I'm the president of the Village of and I'd like to thank Jay and Professor Green for having us all here today. When I was talking to Jay, it was interesting to know, I believe he has an affinity for many of us who are involved in local government, because he's the son of a small town mayor, the mayor of McHenry. And what we were both talking about was as local mayors, we are on the front lines every day of what local government is because we impact the lives of our residents every single day, whether we're providing good roads for them, whether providing water for them, or whether we're providing for public safety. And so what we wanted to talk about today was an issue that was facing all of our local governments. And we're very happy to have this forum here at the City Club of Chicago. Because for over a century, the City Club has served as a forum for thoughtful public discourse on significant public policy issues. Now today, we are privileged to address you on an issue that has implications for all of the communities in which we live and work. See, a financial crisis is brewing in nearly every Illinois community as municipalities are losing ground in their effort to fund public safety pensions. Now wherever you live, we can all agree that our police officers and our firefighters put their lives on the line for us daily. And we can also agree that they deserve a fair pension that reflects the vital public service they perform. However, the current public safety pension system is unsustainable due to Springfield's persistent and unilateral mandating of benefit increases to municipalities who have no reasonable way to pay for them. Consequently, municipalities now have to choose between funding police and fire pensions or meeting our primary duty of providing for our communities health, safety, and welfare. To avoid this predicament, we must reboot the public safety pension system to provide a fair and above all sustainable retirements for our public safety employees without placing an unsustainable burden on taxpayers. And until we do so, the fiscal stability of our communities is at risk. So how did we get here? Well, for years, Springfield lawmakers of both parties layered new benefits on police and fire pensions knowing that they were writing checks with someone else's money, communities and local taxpayers' money. Now, prior to these legislative actions, pension funds across the state were typically fully funded. Then Springfield changed the rules, thereby dramatically increasing communities' liabilities. First, it changed laws so public safety employees can retire at age 50 instead of 55, creating huge unfunded vested benefits. Next, it changed the annual cost of living adjustment formula, switching it from simple to compounded interest. With retirement age and automatic increases of 3% compounded annually, public safety employees may eventually make more in retirement than on the job and may receive a pension check for longer than they earned a salary check. The math adds up to a financial disaster confronting all of our communities. Now, as Professor Green said, I'm from Wilmette, so let me give you some examples about Wilmette. Since 1996, when our police and fire pensions were more than 100% funded, the village annual payments to the police pension have increased over 500%. Payments to the fire pension have increased over 800%. But funding levels have sunk into the mid-60% range. Let me put it another way. Since 2000, Wilmette's pension costs have grown from 15% of the tax levy to 35% of the tax levy. We've increased our police pension contributions to almost $2 million a year annually. We've increased our fire pension contributions to over $2 million a year annually. And since 2000, in total, we've combined to contribute $28 million to our pension funds. And yet, 
our unfunded liability has grown by more than $40 million. And the General Assembly's own study found that the principal driver of these unfunded liabilities since 2000 was not the lost decade of the stock market. It was not because municipalities didn't put enough money into their stock, or did not put enough money into their funds, but instead the very legislative changes made by Springfield were the principal driver in these unfunded liabilities. So in short, when you have increasing taxpayer contributions and deteriorating financial position of funds, these are the hallmarks of an unsustainable pension system. Now I recognize that Will met as a prosperous community with a Moody's AAA bond rating, but I ask you, if Wilmette cannot sustain the system, what municipality can? And this situation is going to become much worse for many communities, Chicago included, thanks to provision inserted in the 2010 pension reform bill at the union's request. Starting in 2015, the state will be able to divert local government revenues directly into pension funds in municipalities that are unable to meet their full pension contributions. This may leave many towns unable to meet their day-to-day -day obligations, leaving mayors like us and many of you in the room to choose between funding public safety pensions or providing for the needs of our communities. Now, as I said before, police officers and firefighters deserve a secure requirement. The public safety employees made their required contributions to the fund, just as Will Met and other communities made their required contribution. But thanks to Springfield, we're all losing the battle, placing our retirees, our taxpayers, and our communities at risk. Now, I also represent the Pension Fairness for Illinois Communities Coalition, and through the coalition, municipalities and business interests from across the state will be in Springfield to urge reforms to the public safety pension system in the upcoming sessions. The tangible solutions, which I expect we'll be discussing in a few moments, are not radical. In fact, they are attributes of the sustainable Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund known as IMRF, the pension fund for non-public safety municipal employees and the best funded statewide pension system. Ultimately, a restructured pen public safety pension system is vital to preserving benefits for our employees, retirees, and providing essential services for our taxpayers. Every day we put off this problem, we continue to increase the burden on our municipalities, making further service cuts inevitable, making tax increases larger, and shifting this crushing burden to our children. We as mayors cannot continue to do that for the communities in which we live and work. Thank you very much for coming today to learn more about this critical issue facing our communities. And I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Mayor Sampley of Westchester to give you a perspective from the western suburbs. I guess I'm a little bit at a, uh, a disadvantage. I am the uh, president of the West Central Municipal Conference. And uh, first and foremost, I represent them, but also I am a retired police officer. As a deputy chief of police, retired from Westchester in 2003, had 28 and a half years of service. I went on to another police department, worked for a couple of years, and now I am the mayor and I work part-time at a police department in LaGrange Park on Fridays. I've been wearing a uniform since 1972. We didn't create this situation that we have, and my fear is that taking somebody's 3% away without having negotiations at the table to do that is very disturbing on, on the police and fire end. A little story, we had a, a police officer that joined the department in 1968. We had to kick him out at 65, although I think he was 67 when we finally got him out. He did not have any social security credits whatsoever maybe a few, didn't have the 40 basic ones so he could get into Medicare. Unfortunately, or fortunately, he married a younger lady, seven years younger, that wasn't obviously close to receiving the Medicare benefits as well. So out of his pension, which is federally taxed but not state taxed, of course, he had to pay approximately $1,500 to stay in the group, the group medical. Uh, that was a problem. 
he had mortgage payments and car payments and everything else in the mix like we all do. Prices are going up continually, but here's somebody with 42 years of service that really doesn't have a stellar retirement as far as I'm concerned. A gentleman that was shot at, hit on top of the head with a uh, pillow full of proceeds in a burglary, um, and could have got killed at any time as a police officer. Same thing with the firefighters. They put their lives on the line every day. We didn't design this. Uh, when I started, the, uh, you had to be 55. There were some negotiations or whatever in Springfield, and it, it went to 50. We had nothing to do with that. At that time, we, we kicked in another 2%. Nobody said anything about it. None of us think about retiring when you have probably under 15 or 20 years on the job. When you get to the 20-year mark, you get a 50% pension, but is that really enough to live on? So it's very difficult for me, certainly as a, uh, a person that obviously receives a pension, to now decide that, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna take something away. I would never, if my police officers down the road that were retiring needed my help, I would gladly give up something to make sure that they get a retirement pension. Um, our wives, you know, Maureen, who's sitting over there, had to put up with me for 27 years as a police officer and now as the mayor. She deserves whatever she gets at the end of that day. Um, what I'd like to say is when we're talking about this, and there's, there's two things in play here. We're talking about fire and police. But the 800-pound gorilla in this room is certainly the school district stuff, and we haven't even scratched the surface on, on that. Police and fire departments, pension boards, mayors like us, state legislators, senators, governor, we need to all be at the table and come out with a fair solution to everybody. It's just like being divorced, guys. You're not going to be happy with the decision, and probably your wife isn't going to be happy with it either. But at least we're going to move on from there and try to fix this. And I think we can. I think the problem is that Springfield hasn't asked for help from any of the mayors who have to deal with a multitude of problems every day that they don't have to deal with. Water pipes breaking, road repair, infrastructure, you name it. We have to play with it every day. Plus, I mean, in our end up here, uh, our combined pension contribution is 11% of our, our general fund. We have uh, the police department presently is about 69% funded, and our fire department, I think it's seven, 78%. So I think we're doing pretty well, pretty well. Um, is it sustainable based on what the, the market may? I don't know. They kicked the timeline up to, what, 2040 now, when we have to be able to do it. Some of the assumptions that you're going to make 7% interest in that, you know, maybe off base, certainly. But I think if we sit down and roll up our sleeves like, like we're doing here today and get involved with, obviously, the unions, because we're going to have to talk to them as well and make sure that, uh, you know, we're going forward. I mean, this is a, this is a very troublesome time that we're in. Our, our communities are, are at risk. But certainly guys that put their lives on the line every day, police and fire, are out there counting on us to make the right decisions for their future. I was in New York. My cousin lost his life in 9-11. I saw the, the effects of that, and that could happen at any time. I was hit by a car on the expressway years ago. I could have been catastrophically injured and my wife having to, to deal with me. Those are the realities of our job. We just lost three firefighters, two, one to a heart attack, one that got killed on the job, and I'm told one as a result of going to New York to help his brothers and sisters succumb to some type of, of lung disease. I had a heart attack in, 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 when I was 49 years old. So guess what? There's not an insurance company out there that's going to insure my heart. As a volunteer in New York, five times. I think I contracted something there, uh, a blood disorder. I'm uninsurable right now. I don't have insurance. If it wasn't for my wife working, guess what? The bus came from me. I wouldn't have anything. So all I'm saying, I want everybody at the table. I want a uh, fair discussion with all of this. And at the end of the day, I'm confident, based on the heads that are here, based on the heads that are in other municipalities or are facing exactly what he said, that is the true fact. 
We're not going to demonize anybody. We're going to go forward and make a fair pension obligation, whether I have to lose part of my COLA or not, or pay, start paying some state income tax to try to get us right. I think there'll be enough for everybody if we try to do this gradually and over time. So thank you. Over to you, Jerry. They give me cleanup, and Paul, I know you're anxious to get some questions, so I'll, I'll make this brief and to the point. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been mayor for 32 years, and at no time during this period have I ever seen a calamity take, that's about to take place in the state of Illinois. First, understand there's five pensions, and those are the teachers' pensions downstate, which are funded by the General Assembly. They give the benefits, they fund it. What we're talking about is downstate police and fire, which includes all suburban and downstate police and fire excluding the city of Chicago. Then you also have the city of Chicago. Well, the dilemma that faces us is bankruptcy. I made a comment about six months ago that if nothing changes, if nothing changes, that mayors are going to be lined up down in Springfield, and hopefully they've got a drive up where we can drop the keys to City Hall in that drive up, because pensions right now, based upon the benefits, are unsustainable, increasing at a rate of almost 20% accrued to a municipality. We can't simply afford it. It's not a question of us not wanting to fund it. It's not a question of understanding the, the importance of our police and fire, but it's a reality, a financial reality of life. It cannot be sustained. Now, we face a, a, a near nuclear bomb that's already taken off and probably a nuclear winter. And I say that because the General Assembly, uh, two years ago when they created a second-tiered pension, which were to lower some of the benefits, put a mandate on local governments. And by the way, the General Assembly is the one who gives the benefit increases away. We have to pay for it. Two years ago on the two-tiered pension system, uh, they changed the benefit pro uh, 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 portions of, of uh, new incoming police and fire, but they mandated, starting in 2015, that municipalities must make each year a percentile over a three-year period up to 100% of our obligated uh, accrued uh, uh, pensions each year. So in three years, and the average right now in the state of Illinois is under 55% funded. So you can imagine what that's going to do to a budget when we're required by 2018, 2019 to fully fund annually that pension. Now I've heard from both sides of the aisle regarding this issue that uh, with the state pensions about, well, it may be unfair because the General Assembly gives those benefits and now they're throwing it to, to uh, the school districts to eventually fund it. Well, they've been doing to that to us for years. We've always had to fund that pension. And the problem we have in the wisdom of the General Assembly is in 1996 when they capped local governments and 80% of cities and villages in this, in this state are non-home rule governments, meaning we cannot raise property taxes other than a cost of living 5%, whichever is less. So in 96, when they did everybody a favor by capping property tax, the whole property tax down, they then threw the burden of an increasing and rising cost of annual pensions to local governments to support through our state sales tax, our state income tax, or any other revenue that we, we generate locally to now make up that difference in the police pension uh, requirements. That's why those actuarials, as the mayor uh, is, 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 is indicated, went from 100% down to an average of 55% because especially non-home rural communities could not make up that difference. And that's the dilemma, that's a crisis we're in. And then two years ago, uh, when we were downstate fighting, the General Assembly was going to take our local government distributive fund, our share of the state income tax, away. Well, guess what? Under this 19 or under this new provision come 2018, if we don't make our payment, guess what they can do? They can take our local revenues coming from our share of state income tax uh, that we, we get from downstate. So they squeeze us on both ends. On one end, they're requiring us to make a full payment. On the other end, they're saying, if you don't make it, we're going to take our state uh, income tax. But yet, even two years ago, they were even going to take away the entire state income tax. So all we would have had left is, is for them to take part of our state sales tax. What I'm getting at is the ideology or the, the intelligence of what's going on downstate. And we face an even greater crisis because just last month, there's going to be a lot more new members of the General Assembly and the need to be educated. They need to understand the crisis that we face as local cities of this pension uh, uh, burden that's taking place, this disaster that's going to take place, because town after town is going to go bankrupt. Quick example, my town is a small community, $7 million general fund. Right now, my obligation just to support police and fire. 
through, uh, through the, uh, salaries and benefits is close to $4 million already. Within three years, I'll be up to a $1 million in annual contributions to the pension, and I'll still be behind. So what's going to happen? That leaves me with $2 million or even less than that to run an entire city. So within five years or 10 years, it's all going to be gone. And so what choices do we have? We have choice to possibly reduce our, 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 our public safety on the streets. We don't want to do that. Do we go and say the only thing that's going to, we're going to operate is a police department and get rid of all other services? Or the worst scenario is that a fund goes bankrupt or is unable to meet its obligations, which we don't want to do. That's the crisis that we face, and it's real. And the General Assembly right now is tangling with the five downstate pensions. They're not even talking about uh, uh, downstate police and fire or the city of Chicago, which faces the same thing. But again, we're also not in home rule, even if we wanted to. Mayor Manuel said he can, because he's a home rule community. He could double the taxes in the city just to make up his annual contribution. We don't even have that uh, opportunity as a non-home rule community. That kind of sums up the crisis. Paul? Okay, I want to round of applause for the... Uh, <clears throat> Everyone uses the word reform like it's a panacea. Just say reform and all these numbers are going to change. Who's going to do that? Any one of you mayors to... Uh... Well, well, it's interesting that you bring up Mayor Emanuel because we have been working with Mayor Emanuel. Many of you remember Mayor Emanuel went down to Springfield in May and talked about solutions for the city's pension funds, which are... Although the magnitude is different, the solutions are the same for what the suburbs are looking at. And, and the, the, the title of today's topic was solving the suburban pension crisis, but it's really solving the suburbs as well as the city. And, and as I mentioned earlier, what the coalition plans on doing is we actually have a series of solutions which dovetail with what Mayor Emanuel has talked about. Um, as the mayor has alluded to, the number one thing that we suggest needs to be done is pausing the COLA for 10 years, that 3% compounded annually. It's not really a cost of living adjustment, it's just a 3% compounded annually. And then after that 10 year period, then it's going to revert back to what's the tier two, the 2010 reform about whether it's going to be half of, well, let me get my numbers here, um, half of the CPI or 3%, whichever is lower. So that's the COLA. The second is to ask our employees to uh, increase their contributions 1% per year for the next five years. Because right now the contributions at our level, at the local level for police and fire are less than 10% of their salary per year. We also want to increase the retirement age for public employees back to 55. But we have to be smart about that because we recognize the valuable public service to police and fire do, and so we have to make sure we're not asking folks to do things that they're physically unable to do so. And last but not least, we're requiring 35 years of service to maximize the pension benefits, just like IMRF. So in answer to your question, who's gonna be able to do that? The General Assembly is the group that has made the rules that all the municipalities have to live by, and so we're confident that when we work with the business interests, we work with the unions, we work with our employees, we work with our retirees, we'll be able to craft a sustainable pension system, and that's what I believe Mayor Emanuel believes is also going to happen with respect to the city's funds. Well. On new employees, would you support defined benefits with 401ks and IRAs instead of, uh, with, no, it should be the other way around, the fine contributions to change it. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Mayor. We, we go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, Jerry. I, I was just going to say, I mean, we, we've talked about that. We've talked about, even during the two-tiered uh, uh, discussions, about putting everybody in IMRF, which, which still is defined, but the benefits are, are what was reasonable, what was established years ago, uh, to go and flip it all the way to a, a private... Uh, uh, a type of setup, we find it probably very difficult and the General Assembly wouldn't even come close to touching something like that. So we are kind of within the box of what's been set out in the benefits and knowing the General Assembly, they'll, they'll look at that box and, 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 and possibly work it out of that. So I, I, I find it very, we find it probably very difficult for them to move into that type of direction. Okay. Uh, count, and within other expenses, should the suburbs consider, now hold on to your seats, a consolidated countywide police and fire department. Let me respond real quick. It's been the cities for the last 12 years, especially the last 12 years, who have pushed for consolidation uh, within our own ranks. We're sharing uh, common uh, police, 
sharing common fire services. We are absolutely for that. As far as integrating that with the county, uh, in fact, I think we're meeting No, just with countywide. Forget about integrating with the county. Just uh, as, as far as a countywide police department? I, I'm not objectionable to that, but uh, again, just for us to do it right now, but amongst ourselves, we're already getting resistance from the General Assembly on coming up with all kinds of consolidation bills sponsored by, uh, unfortunately sponsored by labor, who uh, don't want to see anybody fired. They want management rights. So um, we also need to help from the General Assembly if that's going to take place, because all kinds of ground rules could be set out in the beginning, which will make it impossible to do. You know, the... You know, I came from, uh, uh, I did part of a radio background. I was a 911 coordinator back in the day. And I believe in some consolidation. We're trying to start out slow in the village of Westchester, trying to get other towns around us to do that. But the political will to try to do that because of the things that was just said about somebody might lose their job, this guy won't get put in here, my people are, I got three full-time and, and eight part-time. My part-time are making minimum wage, 10 bucks an hour. Your guys are making $16 an hour. It, it's a hornet's nest to try to, to put all that together to get three mayors in a room to decide what's the <laughs> best for the community when I believe consolidation in that regard would be perfect. Yes, we're all doing the same job. We all kind of handle things. But until the, the mayors want to give up their... Uh, uh, their butt boy powers and have their own little special service of police officers or firefighters, it's, it's not going to happen. It, it'll be way down. The concept is great. They've done it in Metro Dade County. There's a county police or, you know, why can't we be all sheriffs? Everybody wants their little control piece of their little pawns, which other than me, because I was in that position during my tenure there, um, very difficult. And one thing you got to remember that this home rule situation that Jerry was talking about, with the tax caps, unless you're willing to change that, we're in trouble. You, 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 we're not going to have the money to fund whatever. I mean, our negotiations are going on now 2% raise to this, 2% raise to that. Look what happened with the teachers. You know, before my stint as a mayor, I was a school board president for 13, uh, 11 out of 13 years. The city of Chicago, the, the teachers walked out. My granddaughter now has to go to, to school until the end of, end of June as a result of that. The parents got on board and were sympathetic to the teachers. Now, Mayor Emanuel could have said, guess what, I can fix this in a heartbeat. Everybody's taxes are up to pay for the, what, the, what the teachers want. And it's, a, you know, teachers are valuable. I get it. He could have said, this is what's going to happen, and everybody would be happy except the taxpayer. So again, we're in the circle here. It's the taxpayer. I mean, the houses in Westchester, probably the mean value is $170,000. Maybe. I got houses for sale. I was telling my colleagues, 62000 79000 and Larry will tell you, Larry came from Westchester. It's almost the price of the house when it was new. I got X amount of foreclosures. I got people that can't make it. The city of Chicago, you know, not to change off topic, but he just dumped another 15% water rate increase on it that I have to pass on to my residents after I just passed on a 25 and another 15 this year, another 15 next, another 15 next. We were lucky we just passed a non-home rule sales tax. My streets are in horrible shape. How do I fix that infrastructure? How do I do that without money? This is all about money. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 